thank you very much for that wonderful organ music. Makes everyone's morning a little bit happier. <laughs> Welcome to day two of Open Source Bridge. It's Wednesday morning. Welcome back. Yes, day two. Woo. Who had some fun in the Hacker Lounge last night? Yeah, we had done some cool projects last night, didn't we? The Intel folks were out. The uh, Boot to Gecko folks were out. We had some lock picking stuff set up in the Hacker Lounge. That was fun, wasn't it? So if you had fun in the Hacker Lounge last night or if you missed out, well, there'll be more fun in the Hacker Lounge today. It's going to be another great day for hacking on stuff between talks, after talks, at the end of the day. Hacker Lounge will be open all evening again as well. Also, a quick little reminder, we're going to be giving out some more awesome, outstanding Open Source Citizen Awards, and we want your nominations. You can tweet at us in the email that went out this morning. There's also a link there where you can send us some information and some ideas that you have. So we'd love to hear your ideas and suggestions. Please get those to us today or early tomorrow if you have nominations for Outstanding Open Source Citizens. My name is Jim Eastman. Audrey's going to talk for a little bit about today's schedule as well. We're the other two board members of Stumptown Syndicate, and we decided to give Reed and Christy the morning off so they can relax a little bit and have some coffee. Yes. But Audrey's going to tell you a little bit about some other going-ons today. All right. We have a couple of schedule updates. Um, if you have any questions about what is actually on the schedule or if there's been a room change, go to the website, opensourcebridge.org. The online schedule is always the most up-to-date, but there are three talks that either switched rooms or switched times, and uh, this info should also be in your email this morning. We have some lovely merchandise for sale. We have scarves, uh, new t-shirts for this year, last year's t-shirts are on sale, uh, and punk patches in black and white to sew onto your bag. You can stop by registration if you would like to buy one of these things. Uh, we'd like to remind you that there is a hashtag for the conference if you want to share what's going on, what's interesting. Uh, if you want to contact us on Twitter, we are at OSBridge. Uh, if you need help with anything, grab a volunteer in a green t-shirt. If they don't know the answer to what you need help with, they will find somebody who does. If you'd like to be one of those helpful people, we always still need more volunteers. You can stop by the volunteer lounge or check out the volunteer uh, app to schedule assignments. Um, that's also in your email. Thank you again to our sponsors. Without sponsors, we could not have you all here. We couldn't have the organ music and the lovely coffee and snacks. Uh, thank you to Intel, Engine Yard, Google, and Rentrack. And all of our other citizens and friends. So. Now that we've done our quick morning spiel, uh, I'd like to introduce you to this morning's wonderful keynote, Jason Scott. He has been collecting all sorts of technological oddities for any number of years now and doing great, great documentaries about wonderful bits of technological history. He put together a group called Archive Team in 2009 that has been tracking down all sorts of bits of data that hopefully now, thanks to their work, won't disappear from the annals of web history and whatnot. And he's here to talk to us this morning. I'd like to welcome Jason Scott. You can do more. <laughs> no, it wasn't hackers and it wasn't backhoes that would destroy the internet. It's trying to get projectors to work the first time with a Windows box in an environment. Actually, it turns out that's the big thing. All right. How's everyone doing this morning? Yes. A fantastic crowd. That's great. I've been here, uh, I was here all yesterday, and I'll be here for a bit tomorrow, but I'll be here today for a good amount of time after this speech, so I'll, I've really been enjoying the speeches. Love the open source battle rifle talk. Definitely should check that out on the recording. And I also wanted to put a shout out to these guys, because they're doing, an, the, the keynote from yesterday is already up on YouTube in beautiful high definition. That's not what usually happens. Uh, why do I hyper-focus on that? Because I'm one of those people who's worried about losing history. So, for instance, I have... I, I, I used to not tell people what this is. This is a recorder that I bring myself to make sure that in some way what I say is recorded. And uh, don't do that in Washington, D.C. They stare at it endlessly for the entire speech, trying to figure out what that is. 
I want to dedicate today's talk to Mark Weiser, who some of you probably wouldn't have heard of. He's the creator of the idea of ubiquitous computing and calm technology. Uh, unfortunately, he died in 1999, so his ideas, as they become real, are not being credited to him or his name isn't being brought up. Uh, I've been really inspired by his work because it changes the paradigm of how we think about computers. And so I just want to dedicate this talk to him. In terms of my life, too far back, um, I've always really been interested in computer history, and I can't tell why. I have two siblings. I'm the pale one. Brother's a landscaper. Sister jogs. So I don't know what's going on there. But I just loved computers. Computers really attracted me as a young boy. And because of, I think, a, a, a divorce that occurred early in my life, I really got a sense that nothing was permanent, that nothing, anything could change, everything would go on. So when I was very young, when I would call computer bulletin board systems or go into online services, I would download everything I found, and I would put them on floppy disks and have thousands and thousands of text files and programs and images from that period of time. And in 1998, I put up textfiles.com, where I had taken these tens of thousands of files and put them up. Now, textfiles.com has now been up for about 14 years, and it's now to the point that the stuff that I put on there is something that's been around for all of some person's conscious life. So I have college students who tell me that they used to read textfiles.com, got them inspired. So it's become its own little piece of history itself. Um, textfiles.com originally was text files, so it was really nicely named, but it actually turned out not to stick around. I ended up moving into sh uh, shareware CDs, for instance, and right now I have about three million shareware files and hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes of shareware CDs, because I think shareware CDs are one of those lost, forgotten lockers of history. Because when CDs came out, it was 640 megs, and they really become ubiquitous around 1990, 91. It was 640 megs at a time when 10 megabytes could put you in the poorhouse for the month because you couldn't afford that much space. But what happened was, at 640 megabytes, you quickly run out of, of things to put on it and sell. So they start to go after every single source, every single service, and they end up becoming unwitting sociologists, anthropologists, and collectors of history. So we've put up you know, basically hundreds and hundreds of CDs, because I think that's important. But what is that in the physical world? It's something like this where I have this guy who's working on this right now. He's got hundreds of CDs, and he's going through them. The left is the outbox. The right is the inbox. Um, and these are ones that I pick up out of auctions. And uh, I, you know, I, I don't question what they are. I get them. I put them up. Personal philosophy. That's my room. Um, if you look at my room here, you can see... Um, don't look at that. That over here is my first computer, a Commodore PET, which sits by me the whole time. This is my in-pile. This is my lounge area, I guess we'll say. This is my documentary equipment, and here is my main uh, workspace. So I live this thing. And you're like, geez, Jace, that looks really sad in a way. And it's OK, though. I'm working on it, because out back, I've got this. <laughs> and so inside of there, Tons and tons of items ready to be sorted. Actually, this is, looks really way too nice. It actually looks like this right now. Working on it. <sighs> but, you know, it's not just about keeping stuff in your place. You also get to travel. These are hotel key cards. Um, I have been traveling for the last 10 years to meet people, to talk to them, because the fact is, is that artifacts by their very nature, are bones. You know, the stories and the people are the sinews, the muscle that tells you what those bones did. And coming up across a pile that's like this just simply tells you that somebody died in that position. It doesn't tell you whether or not he was a jerk or what his dreams and hopes were. From that, we get the stories from the people themselves. People like John Sheets, who I interviewed in 2003, who is a very interesting fellow. He was the surviving member of a pair of men who had run something called the Ritty Art Contest. And very quickly, Ritty stands for remote teletype, a, uh, a lower bit, so you only had capitals, way of transferring text across radio, which people then would use to send not just messages, but artwork based in text. Well, John had a whole variety of these things for me. So I recorded him talking about it. We looked at a lot of these old items, including this beautiful piece. 
Now, but to understand about this beautiful piece that he explains to me is that it's a 1930s typewriter art transferred to Riddy via telegraph in the 40s, transferred to radio teletype in the 60s, and then converted in the 80s to computers. So it's got a huge, huge amount of heritage behind it with a whole bunch of things. Now, unfortunately, um, John Sheets never lived to see the documentary that I put him in. He died a year later, and his widow was very happy to get an hour of him talking, actually. And this is the problem, is that if we you know, rest, if we say, well, it'll all work out, if we don't take any action, people die, things fade, stuff gets destroyed. So I started a group called Archive Team. Archive Team is a rogue band of archivists, preservationists, developers who are all dedicated to a simple idea, which is let's save as much as we can because everybody apparently is trying to destroy everything as fast as possible. <laughs> the Archive Team idea is it's not our job to figure out what's valuable, to figure out what's meaningful, if we can help it. You have to sometimes make value judgments in any kind of a situation, but saying, well, this surely is uninteresting, this surely is not worth going to, is not what we're doing, right? We, we work by three virtues, right? Rage, paranoia, and kleptomania, okay? So we... We, we keep the anger burning, okay? When I started this in 2009, it was because of the shutdown of, of several services, including AOL Hometown, and um, uh, uh, Lycos had a site, that a tripod, that was being shut down or threatened to shut down. And I said, geez, we need an archive team. And this is where we ended up as a wiki that has on it a bunch of processes that we're up to. We try to give people both what we're about, and we have a site called Death Watch, and Death Watch basically tells us, you know, who do we think is going to die? Like here we see Mobile Me, which shuts down on June 30th, by the way. Fortune City, which died around April. And then Fanfiction.net, which had 7 million fanfiction stories and was shut down a few months ago. Um, you know, we had this situation in the 90s where computers were very new. And it was very interesting to give people free computer access, maybe throw some ads on there and see what happens. Right? What happened was the dot-com crash and then a bunch of buyouts. And it became so cheap to run servers that we kept servers running for years until somebody, somewhere, decided that they needed to uh, 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 move a number from column A to column B, press that button, and delete 7 million stories. And I think that when we look back on this in about 30, 40 years, we're going to be amazed. Does everyone, uh, how many people here know about uh, the mummies as fuel thing? You know, a few of those? Okay, good. So basically what happened was, was that <laughs> initially when they were discovering mummies, they discovered something, mummies burn awesome. <laughs> so for a long time, mummies were being used as fuel. They were being shipped to England and shipped in other locations and used as fuel. Then there was a fuel shortage of mummies, so they started making new ones for a while. Eventually, better forms of oil came in and they got rid of it. But for a while, they were burning mummies because they wanted to read. And, and the thing is, is that that kind of approach now where they want to save something and they want to save money means that they're not saving all of this human history that's going on, right? They're killing off tons and tons of websites, right? Uh, Coghead, who no one gives a crap about, a uh, hometown, you know, it's very important, I think, to grab these goodbye messages because they often show the character of the place that's shutting them down. For instance, down here, I love this one. Thanks for trying Kickstart, which was the Yahoo job. Well, Yahoo, besides sucking, is also a place that would buy five of the same uh, company, right? Five different locations, give them a broken pool cue, and say, work it out, we'll be back in about an hour. And whoever had the best middle manager that acquired them would win. So as you can see here, they even, they even let the victor stand over the body of the, the, the thing that died, right? So goodbye. I, I just love this because she's looking at a light bulb like, whoop, see that? Going out. <laughs> a 
additionally, over here, you see where it says trim. Well, trim was URL shortener, right? URL shorteners are the stupidest fucking idea we've come up with in the last 10 years. We have turned our entire web experience into a set of one-time cryptographic pads run by people we don't know. That is insane. We will look back on that like living in a stair house, a stair, next to a staircase with no rails and running up and down it all of our lives. Like, what were my parents thinking? They weren't thinking to put in a staircase with a rail. Well, we're sitting here letting all of these URL shorteners die, right? So I've got a group that is actually working to um, just basically back them up. And we're getting resistance from some of the URL shorteners. And I'm sorry, if your business plan could be removed by a 45K file of a gzip text file of all of your URL shorteners, you didn't have a very good business plan. So, under, you know, being the one who shouts, not just that the emperor has no clothes, but the emperor is an asshole, <laughs> is where we're going about it. These two are what really pissed me off, right? Um, this on the left here is Yahoo's GeoCities closing. Yahoo's GeoCities at the time was this insurmountable idea that the 290th, I believe it was, website in the, in the world would be shut down in a really terrible way. Like, they basically buried that they were going to shut it down in a help entry, which said, why isn't this feature working? Oh, because of the impending shutdown, that feature has been decommissioned for the moment, was their initial announcement. Then with some screaming, they said that it would be, you know, in October, and then they kind of made up which date it was going to be. I have yet to figure out why October of that date made any sense. Usually you can track it by financial quarters. They want the item dead before the next financial quarter so they can say that liability has been removed. On the right is Magnolia. All right? Now, Magnolia is a classic case of a beautiful community and everyone shares things, okay? But it was run by an idiot. One day, he, they were down. He said, oh, we have a database problem. Two days later, oh, we have a database outage. Three days later, oh, it appears I have lost absolutely everything. Which is tough. You know, usually you need some sort of wolf god or some sort of angered magic to make that happen. But he actually lost his database and he lost all the rest of it because it turned out they weren't not only not doing any backups, but it turned out that they were basically pushing the backup to a database instance that didn't work for two years. Now, on the right, again, was this guy running it who then went on a podcast with a friend <laughs> to explain what was going on. And he said, well, you have to realize this will always burn in my memory. And if I meet him, it won't be pretty. He said, you have to realize this was back in 2002. Backups weren't really this big thing yet. <laughs> All right. And the thing is, is this is allowed to run rampant in these days. You know, we have people who say backups aren't important or don't worry about it. You know, trust us. We're really in a great shape. Right. But it destroys things like this, right? Patrick Joel Maliki, who was loaned to us, this is a website from GeoCities about a child that was born in 1981, died in 1983. And that really strikes me because when you, when you look at it this way, it's sad enough, but then you realize that this woman created this web page on GeoCities in 1996, which means 13 years after her two-year-old died, for whatever reason, she had to tell the world about her son. And he was part of an angel's web ring. All these women who were talking about their babies who, they, who had been loaned to them, they were angels. And so this was just wiped away. Now, obviously, since you're looking at it, it wasn't quite wiped away because of the work of my team, because we went into GeoCities and downloaded as absolute much of it as possible. It turns out GeoCities is a friggin' couple of terabytes. Oh, wow. Oh, no. How will that insurmountable big data problem be solved? That's going to like require one trip to Best Buy <laughs> to clear that up. So all these bastards are dying, right? We got, you know, Splendor is gone. My podcast died with uh, a whole two weeks of warning, which was very appreciated. And MobileMe, which is shutting down on June 30th. Um, and now MobileMe is an example of a service that a lot of people use if they have Macs. And Apple did this thing where they're upgrading to their new... Um, service, and they were like, yep, we're going to transfer your stuff to the new service. Oh, except for the web pages. And here's some mail so that you can get the web pages. So, you know, basically you come home and it's like, well, we're moving your house, but, you know, here's half your stuff and a toothbrush. 
So it'd be good, good for you to do it. Um, all right, let's, let's go. Okay, so um, the thing is, is that the fundamental thing I want to get across, because I'm going to move to actual things involving open source, is Archive Team was started out of anger and a feeling of powerlessness, this feeling that we were letting companies decide for us what was going to survive and what was going to die. And our solution was, fuck you. We're going to fix that problem. If we can't fix it, we're going to make everyone know you caused this problem. And we're going to find more people who will run into this problem who don't know it yet and educate them that this problem exists. The shortest warning I've had for a, sh a shutdown is 48 hours. The longest one that I know of is eight months. And everybody has their own rules for how you do a shutdown. Some of them provide an export tool to say goodbye. Most don't. Many of them say, oh, you know, press right click on all your stuff that you've been uploading for five years, and you can have it. You're welcome. And, and I think that, you know, if, if, if anything else comes across, it's this sense of we have to fix things, okay? So I'm going to give you a quick few, quick few examples of what we've been up to. All right, so wget, <laughs> which uh, everyone here knows wget, I hope. wget, Curl's little retarded old buddy, um, basically is a, a program for grabbing files remotely using universal resource locators. And it has a whole bunch of ways of grabbing things. And when it grabs them, it gives you a copy of those files. And if you're lucky, it'll grab the timestamp. It's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a wonderful utility. But there's another group of people out there who are doing web archiving. And that group uses something called WARC, right? WARC is based off of Mark. It's not really, though. WARC is actually kind of a way of saying, we're as good as Mark. Like, if you're somebody who knows what Mark is, by calling it WARC, you'll feel that, oh, this has something to do with what we're doing. Um, Mark is basically the universal way to find bibliographic materials, and it's gone through many versions over the years, and it's what the Library of Congress uses to make every individual book have meaning, you know, the printing and everything else. WARC was an attempt to do the same thing with websites, so that it would bake in all of the meta information about that website and how it was grabbed and where it ended up with, so that you would be able to get... Uh, a website into that same massive political system that was Mark by making Wark. So these Wark guys think they're really like the cutting edge, but the problem is, is only archivists care about Wark, right? Because nobody knows what Wark is outside of that group. All it needed was somebody to combine them. So we did that, and I sent a volunteer from the archive team, and WARC is in the next version of WGET that comes out. You'll be able to say, oh, also save off a WARC, which means that not only are you grabbing your own, your own copy of this animated GIF, you are also keeping a industry-ready archive.org internet archive wayback machine compatible file that gives exact information as to what you grabbed and when, meaning it has to another group of people an amazing amount of information. The WARC people had the standard, the dream, and the goal, and no action. Though WGET people had the action and the activity, but didn't care about something like WARC. And all it took was one developer of mine to work for two weeks, and he totally has now changed downloading history because he's able to do this. It was just throwing one person. And he was able to do this because WGET was open source, and WARC was an open format on ISO. So... I'm a fan of open source. I mean, let's, let's be clear about that, right? Archive team would not exist without open source. It would just be one ranting asshole screaming about this terrible world and saying something should be done. All right? The way I learned about GitHub was that I was on the archive team IRC channel, and somebody said, yeah, I've pumped all of our new stuff into GitHub. And I'm like, what is that? And I go over to it, and I go, well, that's cute. That looks like a web-based revision system. And they're like, it's much more than that. It's really awesome. And I'm like, okay, have fun. And I found that their productivity jumped, spiked really fast because they were all able to share out their ideas and work on things and scream at each other and make changes. I'm a big fan, a huge fan. 
Uh, if you go to wget right now and grab it, it won't um, have it right now because wget, I have discovered, takes about a year. It sits on a new revisions for about a year because it's wget. You don't want somebody flipping it out. So the development has really slowed down. It's, you know, that's kind of what happens with a mature project. It's like, let's not rock this boat. Our biggest thing right now is something called the Archive Team Warrior. Um, the Archive Team Warrior came because one of the things we were initially doing when we would go after a site, would we would all download it and we would like send each other wiki changes to coordinate and we'd say, you download this user range, you download this user range. Doesn't scale, doesn't scale at all. So we created the idea, and of course, and the other problem with Windows users. And I, I don't like machine religion, but what we would have is we'd have somebody who come in, you know, one of the, the magic things of Archive Team is it's, it's a place of action, right? right? Th these are young, uh, uh, active, angry people who share this dream I have of saving these things, and they want to help, and they're here to help, and they think just by existing, they're helping. And the problem is, is a lot of these sites use timestamps and Unix uh, uh, conventions that are not compatible with the Windows file system. So if somebody grabs it and they put it through Windows, it comes out really broken, really floating upside down in the fish tank. And they felt really like, can I still help? And then inevitably they'd go, I have Sigwin, right? I'd be like, that's nice <laughs> that you have Sigwin. And they'd work really hard to put in Sigwin. Like they really wanted to put in Sigwin. And all they would do is produce this big pile of horse shit. But the problem wasn't them, it wasn't their fault. It's because we weren't thinking enough out of the box. The Archive Team Warrior is a VM. It sits in VirtualBox or anything else. When you boot it up, it boots up a Debian, it wakes up, it finds out what Archive Team projects are running, it asks you, which one do you feel like being a hero in today? You tell it, and then you walk away. It is literally Archive at home. And it works, therefore, on Linux, on Macintosh, on Windows. You can be a warrior today. You can download it. It's just a couple hundred megs. Sits on archive.org. And you can be a part of the archive team in probably about 10 minutes. Two if you're stealing bandwidth from work. <laughs> Overnight if, you're, if, if, if you haven't really switched to anything yet. But you can do it. You can be a hero, and it will work, and it goes to a universal tracker, as we call it, that does all the hard work of keeping track of what's been assigned. So it has timeouts. It's got all the stuff. We've been revising this thing for a long time. I would love for some of you to look at it, see if there's anything else we need to uh, approach. This is being done mostly by a small handful of developers, and it's all open source, and it's all these tools that we use to download these sites. But you know, as a project manager, I know this isn't very interesting, but this is interesting. It turns out leaderboards make people do things. <laughs> so this is the Mobile Me project. And you can see up here that right now Clojure is winning. He's winning. He's downloaded 253,000 users, 174 gigabytes. Up here you can see how many users we have, uh, how many users we have, and over here we have averages and what we think they're made of. And over here is a constantly scrolling example. I apologize, this is actually Splendor, which is the Italian GeoCities. It was in every way like GeoCities, except lots more nudity. <laughs> and people love this graph, this constantly shifting graph, showing here's how you start getting, and then this guy shows up and takes everyone out to lunch. But you, know, you can see all of the bandwidth and how we're moving and how we're slowly growing the site until finally we grabbed all of Splendor. And that took a few months, but we did it. Splendor only crashed three times. <laughs> so I call it a success. They actually had to move their closure date two months because of us. <laughs> success. Tableau is a photo site, okay? Tableau was bought by HP, which also bought Snapfish, PoolQ, <laughs> Tableau Lost. Tableau's upside down on the pool table, right? Tableau was a thing that lets you make little galleries, tableaus, and lets you write little stories and put your stuff up. And this is, this is all that remains of Tableau, by the way. This is it. This is its gravestone. And so right there you see, bye. 
buckers. So, here's an example of a tableau. I love this tableau. This is a tableau made by an employee at Tableau when one of the sprinklers broke. <laughs> so, up here, you can't read this, and I apologize for that, but he basically says, yeah, for like 90 seconds, I was taking pictures before I realized it was destroying Tableau. <laughs> so, over here, you can see they, had, they were really proud of their tableaus. I mean, look, here's a tableau that was on the wall. These are all tableaus that are on the wall. Goodbye. It keeps going down. He took pictures of the firemen. Then he took pictures of them with the six inches of water and moving all the servers up to shelves. And it's all captured on this tableau of the destruction of tableau. <laughs> One that's not so funny but I think is really extremely important is this tableau. This is a man's house burning down. And... What's the thing is, is he recorded it. He recorded it. He lost everything. He lost his entire thing. And at the bottom, he thanks Tableau for being up because that's the only place where all his 5,000 photos were. So they deleted that, by the way, with 30 days' notice. Obviously, we have a copy, but still. Now, Tableau was one of the first real runs of the archive team Warrior, right? And like I said, it had taken us about four months or five months to download GeoCities, it took us about three or four months to download Splendor, even with the outages. You know, these were tough going as we were pulling these things apart. Um, Tableau, we actually downloaded in 36 hours with 59 people running at full bore. Because, you see, they gave everyone two weeks to take everything down in a public fashion. In other words, they had sent out mail, like it's going to be 30, but then they did an official like two weeks before. We found out about it seven days before. We downloaded it in 36 hours, and then it was gone. Right? And this is hundreds of thousands of photographs. Hundreds of thousands. And if you think, well, but they notified people, there's, there's what I call the snorting geek thing of like, they should have kept backups. That's not how it works. The worst thing you can do in front of a car accident is tell people, you know, man, you should have really worn your seatbelt. I wouldn't have done that. Anyway, we found that a lot of people were actually losing all their stuff and that we um, uh, uh, were providing for them a service. So we actually put up a hot restore for them. You could type in your username and get your pictures right back. All right? Turns out a lot of women were using Tableau to keep track of their children's growth because I got fan mail from this woman um, who wrote us just to say thank you because we're not just users or customers. We're not just that. We are people, and everything we had was being wiped out. So thank you for bringing back all the photos of my child. Uh, because they were all gone for her until we found them back. You cannot imagine. So, so for everybody who then goes, wait a minute, is this legal? What about the, aren't you being like really forward? Shouldn't you ask permission? I'm like, this is why we do it. Because these people had their history taken away. And the people we are also doing it for aren't born yet. Artists, too, by the way, we're actually to the point now, and this is how fast it is, right? Which is that we're now to the point that data that we've downloaded is now being used in art projects already. So these two folks uh, take GeoCities and do something called one terabyte of kilobyte age, where they analyze some aspect of GeoCities, like borders or selling middies or how did that all work, right? Uh, like here, they're talking about borders and how did it run, and they have a beautiful website to that. Similarly, uh, they make fun of the fact that I didn't, when we, we did this, we did this in a very amateur fashion. This was before the tracker. They go in to go, look what they screwed up. Like, they know me, but they're doing this also. Like, man, they really failed here and they did this. It's the, it's the archivist looking at the relic going, man, I can't believe they stored the butterflies like this. Jesus. And the thing is, though, they were only stored two years ago from people who are still alive, from a company that shut it down who's still here. So things are getting really fast. When I show this to archivists, they're like, ah, because, you know, they're used to like, well, in 50 years, we'll go check out the estate. And it's not like that anymore. We have artists creating things like the deleted city. I love the deleted city. Basically, this guy went and took GeoCities and made it into a browsable touch screen that sits on a wall. And you can scoop down into various sites and look down at various locations, see what they're made of. And as you pass sites that had music, it plays the music quietly as you go by beautiful, beautiful piece of artwork. And you can go all the way down to the image. He's got funding for this. That's crazy. This man is living off of GeoCities. <laughs> He's the last guy living off of GeoCities. 
The other group, going, you, you, showing us up with deleted city, went back and made this massive map of every person who was on GeoCities and how much space they took. And they even went in and helped them with this thing, where they basically analyze it, and they have things that they call link cancer, which was where we got stuck in loops because there were symbolic links, and Yahoo didn't know how to do symbolic links properly, so it would get stuck in these little tumors of, of download. And this is what's going on now from stuff that's now gone, but not gone. just want to mention one last project that I've really been involved in. I'm getting back to open source here. The nice lady told me I had five minutes, easily ten minutes ago. But let's just quickly go through this. JavaScript mess is my passion right now. Um, let me explain what that is. If you're familiar with the MAME um, emulator, a lot of people are. It's an emulator that plays arcade machines. Uh, you put in a ROM, and you can actually play that game as it was. Mind-blowing, right? In fact, there's, it, it supports so many things that there's a web page to tell you what it doesn't emulate and why. That's how much it emulates, right? Well, a group of people did a second project that I think is even more exciting, and it's called MESS, okay? MESS is the multi-emulator super system, and what it is is MAME, you would say MAME, an arcade game, MAME, Pac-Man, now you're playing Pac-Man. With MESS, you say MESS, Atari 800, Preppy, which was a Frogger clone, and you're playing Preppy in an Atari 800 emulated on your system. It supports 628 discrete computer systems. It has 1,600 uh, variations in total, right? This is a powerful piece of software for computer history. So I thought, let's port it to JavaScript. Now, before you get angry, um, <laughs> the reason I chose JavaScript is because it's an open source, open format system for running programs in computers that does not rely on Larry Ellison's nutsack. <laughs> and so I chose it because it was something that had become Turing complete and had the ability to, to work, right? And to convert something to JavaScript easily, you can use something called mscripten, which will do the conversion work. And you also um, you know, can then convert it to JavaScript and do additional optimizations. Will it be fast? Not as fast as one would like. Not great, uh, but it can be done, because we've done it, right? We've done it. Um, this is an example page that I put up where it talks about the Odyssey 2, which some of you may not be familiar with. It was an old computer system, uh, an old console system from the early 1980s, and there was a game on it called Casey Munchkin, and Casey Munchkin got sued out of existence in 1981. It's the first software look and feel lawsuit. Atari sued them because Atari had the home rights to Pac-Man, and one. And that's interesting, but it's much more interesting in your browser to be able to pop it up and play it immediately as it was. And before you get hung up on like, well, great, you've just now brought a video games to a whole new generation. It's not like that. I did the games, but we're going to be able to do everything from PDP-1s, which this thing supports, all the way up through DOS and beyond as time goes on. Will it always be JavaScript? Probably not. Will it always be just these kind of games? No. Will it expand? Yes. Will it get better? Yes. I hope so. Working with the Emscripten team, because let me tell you, Emscripten was not ready for mess. That was not nice. We have taken six months of his life away, working at the Mozilla Foundation, where he currently spends the time on it. But by working on these open source projects, both of these efforts that I think are very valuable are being improved. I would love for you to join in on that. So, you know, keynotes are supposed to set the tone of the day, and so this is a very hostile day. Sorry about that. <laughs> but the thing is, is that the reason I'm hostile is because I'm passionate. The reason that I do this is because I'm passionate, right? When I wake up, um, my current full-time job, which I love, is I am, uh, my official title is Free Range Archivist at the Internet Archive. And what I do is, with the Internet Archive is I go around finding groups who are desperately in need of bandwidth and space for their open projects and convince them to host them with us. So for instance, some of you might not know the Muse Open project. That was one I was very proud of. Muse Open is a project by a man who basically is hiring orchestras to play out of copyright classical music pieces and then release them fully into the public domain. Because you can't have Beethoven's Fifth 
by just playing it because you're probably playing something by the Prague Orchestra and they're going to sue you. Well, not anymore. M-U-S-O-P-E-N. Well, he wanted to, he did a Kickstarter. He asked for $5,000, I believe. He got $75,000. He did about 30 pieces by hiring an orchestra, and he walked everyone through it. And then he had all the individual recording flutes, which is what they call in the, the, the multi-track business. So individual tracks of the uh, roughly 60 microphones aimed at a full orchestra. And he had nowhere to put it. He was desperate because he was putting it on, I think, either DreamHost or another shared hosting service, and he just couldn't store it. And I went to him and said, What's that thing, 600 megs, 600 gigs? He's like, yeah. I'm like, boom. So he did it. So archive.org slash detail slash muse open, and you can go ahead and download lots and lots of public domain music. Um, you know, just reaching out to these people. That's what makes me happy, right? That's my whole life now, saving things for later. And I hope that when you're working on projects, when you're working on things, realize that you are a part of history that you are creating things that matter to people years down the line. It helps to put things together and store them away. Don't worry, we'll have crazy robots in the future that will untie what you've done. So don't get all hung up on like, but it's not as perfect as it could be, and there's no XML metadata to explain what I was up to. Just press record on an MP3 player, talk about what the hell you just did, leave it in there as a WAV file or an MP3, move on. History will thank you. Otherwise, we're going to spend the next 100 years going, what was Ward thinking? <laughs> this is just the fact that I, if, if I seem that I'm really like, full of conflict and, and weirdness, it's because it is. This is an emotional side of the business, and I think that there should be more emotions. I mean, not the emotions of, I hate you because you compiled using the wrong flags, right? But, like, why aren't we working even harder? Now, there is an unbelievable amount of passion in this room. I wouldn't even have to put this slide up for this group. You guys care. I sat around yesterday. You care. And I think that's something that needs to be passed on because it's not just a job, right? You know, architects who put rivets together built buildings that have stuck around for, for, for decades and now you are putting together the rivets of software that will beat at the bottom of somebody's refrigerator in 2050 and you just don't want anything to spoil, do you? No. Um, <laughs> I love capturing history as it happens. Here's a car accident. And here is somebody being led away <laughs> from a, a Dance Dance Revolution game. <laughs> and if I have to wrap up with any kind of personality, it's both... Rock until you drop, which is pretty cool. But I also want to point out the two guys who just kept playing. <laughs> so thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you so much.